So let's talk about what we mean by the coast. So this is coastal and marine management. So the next phase after this sort of introductory uh, section here, we're going to talk a bit about um, marine ecology, oceanography, just because we don't have familiarity with that. And so, uh, so we'll run through that. Um, but by and large, uh, even though this is coastal and marine, um, really the, the most, uh, the vast majority of the challenges and the vast majority of our focus over the next many weeks is going to be on the, the immediate coastal zone. And so we need to define that and talk about what that means. So if you fall asleep, if I totally bore you, if you're in a, a lunchtime stupor or whatever, this is, these are the key points from this, uh, this discussion we're going to have uh, for the next many minutes. Um, uh, we have a lot of people in and right next to the coast. Um, it's just, uh, it's been that way for a long time and it's just intensifying as we go through time. So for example, most of our largest concentrations of humanity which we usually call cities or urban cores or urban areas, um, the biggest ones of those typically are in the coastal zone, either right next to um, the ocean or just a very close proximity to the ocean. If we look at the density of folks, so the number of people per unit area, the coastal zone has the greatest density overall if we look at the planet wide compared to any other inland area or other, other region of the coast. Talking about our country for a second, the, the so-called seaboards or the areas right next to the ocean, which is a sort of older term, but, but those seaboards, if you will, along the East Coast, the Atlantic Coast, the West Coast, the Pacific Coast, or the, our Southern shores, the Gulf Coast, um, that's where huge amount of economic activity happens. The Silicon Valleys, the shipping and exporting, importing from China, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, the coasts are really um, the happening places in terms of economic activity and also, by and large, uh, social stuff, social movements, um, um, environmental justice movements, um, uh, uh, political movements, a lot of those things. Not entirely, of course, but, but we are overrepresented in our creativity, in our economic output. Um, those of us that live uh, next to the uh, next to the ocean, uh, and then overall, just sort of summarizing all that, we really do have some distinct demographic patterns and 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 um, and long-term trends uh, here in the coastal zone that affect everything from from who's living here, the composition of of who, um, how people move around, migration, how we exchange goods and services, trade. Um, different uh, laws and, and policies that we create to regulate ourselves and our surrounding environment. And just in general, the environmental conditions uh, at the coast. So a couple uh, key ideas to get us going um, and to make sure we're framed properly. There's more people alive today, even though we haven't defined it yet, uh, in the coastal zone than were alive in the, across the entirety of the planet in the 1950s. So we have a 1950s uh, Earth population now just really close to uh, the coast. Overall, and this, this will vary a little bit depending on how we define stuff, and we'll talk about that in a second, but um, about a billion people live just in the immediate coastal zone of our planet, with the vast majority of those folks in Asia, in particular Southeast Asia. Uh, we have some data uh, f that, that um, either you've looked at in, or we started to look at in our lab this week, or if you guys, if we were in our Monday section, we'll be, we'll be doing that. Um, uh, you haven't quite done that yet, but uh, basically we're talking on the order of um, about a third of the U.S. population lives in so-called shoreline counties, so a county that touches the ocean, um, touches the shoreline. Um, and, and in last time we did our census, that was a little bit north of 123 million folks that were articulated. The, the guesstimate is when we do this next survey uh, in 2020, it's going to be on the order of maybe about 134 million. Um, the census has unfortunately, like so many things, become uh, politicized, which is crazy because that uh, one of the few th things in the Constitution that we're charged with measuring specifically is enumerating the number of people every 10 years but that has become a fodder for um, 
the political forces and the forces that aren't interested in actual robust statistics and, and enumeration, um, they see that as an opportunity to, to gain the system. So, so it, it's a huge um, concern amongst those of us that are interested in how many people are living where, um, how that census rolls out. And, uh, but we'll just say that it's probably gonna be on the order of about you know, north of 130 million people in the immediate coastal zone in the US. Okay, so I grew up in Northern California. And anybody, anybody else from Northern California? Okay, a few, a handful, a few of us weird people that are down here. Um, now, when I grew up in Northern California, there was this whole rhetoric. It was the North versus the South. So I was just up in San Francisco this last weekend, and person was saying, one lady I was talking to was, hey, how's it going, blah, 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 this and that. And she's like, where do you live? And I said, oh, I live in Ventura County, like, sort of like halfway between Santa Barbara and Los Angeles. It's this county. Like, oh, yeah, I know where that is. Like, great. And then the next question was, you're the one to take all the water, right? <laughs> so when I grew up up there, that was the, that was the narrative. Was like, those bastards, you know. So we had a, a drought, not as big as our last drought. We had a drought in the 70s when I was a kid. And I remember, uh, I remember the, um, the newspapers would, would say, oh, how well are we doing this month or, you know, the last couple months. And it was always, you know, San Francisco, Contra Costa, Marin, all, all these northern California counties. You know, we reduced water usage by like 37% and all this, like, yay. And they would show like L.A., Orange County, and it would be like, they reduced by 4%, you know. And we're like, those bastards, you know, they take all the water. You know, it's like an us versus them thing. So that, that sort of dynamic um, is how, when I grew up, that's how it was portrayed, north versus south. So, for example, um, and this isn't exactly northern versus southern, but this is sort of typically how it would play out. That the story of California, politics, money, resources, whatever it is, is an is a up versus down thing, a north versus south thing. Um, the reality, it's not that at all, not even close. The reality, the primary uh, structure in our state, in terms of whatever we want to pick, is coastal versus inland. That's the real, those are the real, if you will, two Californias. And so, um, and, and, and we could spend all afternoon going through this, but for example, the, as we just mentioned to start our, our lecture, the vast majority of people live at the coast, right? So there's more, more people there. Um, and whatever we want to, this is some polling data, but it, it, you, know, you need to read, read the words. You just look at the colors, right? So we see in general, there's, there's one color pattern next to the coast, and it's different for the rest of the, the state. And the one on the left here is attitudes towards global warming. The one here in the middle is attitudes towards offshore drilling. And the one on the right is attitudes towards state government. It, it, it just goes on and on, right? So, so um, we could pick all kinds of measures. We could talk about um, how easy is it to afford a house in these areas. Now, this data is actually national data, but again, um, not knowing exactly what the units are doesn't, doesn't matter so much. It's just the pattern continues to emerge. So by and large, there's something going on the eastern, on the, on the um, area next to the coast, and it's different by and large from the middle of the country. Is purple like you die before you can afford a house? Basically, <laughs> basically. Probably your kid has to die before you could afford a house, probably is what it is. It's probably like two generations kind of thing. But yes, you guys get the idea. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Super positive, staying positive, that's good. Okay, um, this figure is, I, I need to update this with the last decade of data, but, but the, the, point is still makes, uh, the point is still consistent. Back in the day when we were early, Northern California dominated um, uh, the population of, the, of our state. That was because Monterey, the, the historical capital of our state, um, before we were even a state or part of the U.S., um, uh, Sacramento, San Francisco, the big cultural economic powerhouse, all that stuff was in Northern California. And what we see over time, particularly after World War II, which is a major break for us here in California, at the U.S. and the world in general, but, but particular in California, um, we see there's a much more, you know, there's, a, there's a shift. And now the Southern folks uh, tend to, tend to dominate, right? And that's basically the rise of the greater Los Angeles and San Diego uh, metroplexes, right? With people coming in and, and after World War II, you know, coming from Iowa or something 
and they come here and they're, they're shipping out typically to go to war and they're like, whoa, this place is better than the place I came from. So I wanna, when, I, when I'm done with this um, horrible war thing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chill here. So businesses did that, individuals did that, families did that, and that's what, um, th that's the sort of north versus south uh, difference. But even back in the day, this, this gross pattern of the coastal versus inland is still the same. So this, this uh, phenomenon of a coastal versus inland is very long and has been a part of our species for quite some time. Okay, so next we gotta say what we mean by the coastal. Is this, is this cool? Question so far? Everybody's very quiet. I'm not used to you being so quiet. Okay, so, so what do we mean by the coast or the, or the, or the so-called coastal zone? Um, different ways we can talk about it. So here's, here's a, an artist rendering of a couple different islands on the right. And I think when we say the coast, a lot of, we tend to think of this. A picture or in our, in our mind, we see a little bit of land and a little bit of ocean. Or at least I would say that that's common, that we, we have that, that sense, right? And that's nothing wrong with that. Um, here's another shot of the coastal zone. In this case on the left, this is a satellite image from a few years ago uh, uh, off in the Arabian Sea and the land mass is obviously on the left and on the right is the ocean and the white that we're looking down at those are clouds. But this is a dust storm activity. And this is a great example of it, it's, it can be hard to figure out what is the coast, right? So in this case, what these, what these uh, sort of a hair, you know, like hair blowing in the wind type stuff. This is uh, uh, sediment, dirt, soil that start on the left and because of the winds at the time when they snap these photos, they're blowing way offshore, right? So much so that you can't even see through these clouds, right? So, so essentially the thickness or the opacity of a regular big high, you know, stratus cloud type thing. So, so what's, the, what's the coast? Is the coast to the, is the coast this strip right along the water land edge? Could be. Is the coast the area out here into the ocean where the dust is blowing or frequently blows or something like that? Is it, is it the reverse? Is it the area where the, where the water might, might you know, flood in or something, right? So, that, so it's not a, um, not a trivial thought as to how we, we, we carve up and what we define as the coast. Generally, it's important for you guys to keep in mind that the, the coast is a three-dimensional structure. In practice, though, we typically think about it as a two-dimensional thing, as a skin, as a, as, a, as a map on a computer screen type of thing. We will consider the coastal zone for the purposes of our class, um, I, I think the best well, th these are all potential definitions. So the first one is the terrestrial, meaning the land, and the aquatic, meaning the water-based regions close to the shoreline or the, or the coastline. Those, aren't, those two terms don't mean exactly the same thing, but at this starting point, you can consider them the, the same thing for the next few minutes. So all the terrestrial stuff, all the water stuff near the shore. The best uh, definition, I think, is are the next two bullets. So the coastal zone, and, and this is the one we'll use um, most broadly, unless we're, we're, we're talking about a specific uh, challenge or a specific uh, data set or something. I think the best conceptual definition is the terrestrial area that directly influences the ocean. So notice it didn't, doesn't say influences, because everything in theory can influence everything, right? In our planet, we're, we're an integrated system. But I mean the terrestrial area that directly, very obviously, we could pick something and, and measure it and see, ah, yes, this thing, this sand grain that's blowing off this uh, dune went out into the ocean, et cetera. So the terrestrial area that directly influences the ocean. And that could be influenced either in physical substances, materials, or energy flow. So that's the landward side of the coast. The oceanward side of the coast is essentially the exact opposite of that. So it's the ocean area that influences the land. So the coastal zone is the, the landward stuff that influences the ocean and the oceanward stuff that influences the land. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so one of those words in there we had was the term shoreline. What the heck does shoreline mean? 
So shoreline is basically the water line. What does a water line mean, right? So this gets, uh, this gets uh, into some technical definition. So the first thing I'll say is that we have a couple different types of tides. If you've taken Dr. Patch's oceanography class, you know this. If you haven't, you may or may not. If you're a surfer, maybe you know this, but if, if not, maybe you don't. So we have, um, there's a, uh, different types of tides we have, the going up and the going down of the ocean um, on a re regular basis, depending on where we are on planet Earth. So some areas have what's called a diurnal tide, some have a semi-diurnal tide. We here in, um, in Southern California, and indeed most of the, coast of the, of the coasts of the planet, we have what's called a mixed semi-diurnal tide. So we have this one. So this is, this, is our, this is our situation. Familiar to you probably, we have, a, uh, we have two highs and two low tides every day. And the mixed part of that is that we have um, a, a higher high. So there's a high, there's a low high and a high high, and there's a low low and a high low. Cool. And so, for example, if I'm looking in this this middle figure here, um, what we're what the x excuse me the y-axis is that's the elevation above uh, sort of a neutral condition. We can say that. So. As this trace goes up, that would be the water rising, the tide getting high, kazoon tide. And as it goes down and goes below zero, it would be a negative tide or it would be a, a falling tide or a low tide. So for, to be precise, when we say um, shoreline, we're talking about the quote unquote water line. We're defining the water line in most instances for most of these databases that you guys would be using, which in turn is what most of the policymakers, et cetera, will use. By waterline, we mean the mean higher high water, and that's the average high tide um, measured during the high time. So, so, so higher high water, right? So we mean so we're talking about the the uppermost hump of this of this uh, figure of this of this elevation of the water, and we're looking at that at the the high, so of the two we're looking at the higher one, and we're looking at that over the times of particularly high tide when we're, we're in the high tide season of the month and of the, of the year. So it's, it's the high high. And, um, and that's where we, you have to draw the picture somewhere or, or draw the, the point somewhere. And so that's typically where we, where we um, do that. And so the shoreline then for most government purposes, most political purposes is shoreline means the water line means the mean higher high water. Cool? All right, and, and again, to figure that out, if you walked out, you wouldn't know, right? We'd have to sit out there with, with measuring devices and actually measure it. Okay, here's the level, here's the height it was today at noon or something, and then let's go measure it, you know, tomorrow at noon, et cetera. And so, so it's not necessarily an intuitive thing, but just glancing at it, you can sort of see the rack line. You can see where stuff is deposited is, is typically a, a quick and dirty estimate of the mean high or high water line. Good? Okay. Uh, the next thing you say is there's no single definition of the coast that works for us in all instances. So there's a, there's a and, and there are many more than I'll talk about today. I'll just say that we're just going to hit some of the examples to give you guys the flavor. And you guys have had some readings about this. Uh, the first is a distance-based definition of what is the coastal zone. And, and I should say that, um, uh, never mind, I'll hold that off. Okay, so distance-based definition. So it's usually best... And to use distance-based stuff when we're worried about some particular stressor, some particular pressure on the coast. So, for example, we could think of something like um, how we had that one graph. You guys, you guys messed yourself, right? When you saw the picture of the housing prices, right? So, how far inland do we have to go to see the housing prices change? That would be a uh, a, a reason to use a distance-based measure of the definition of the in the coastal zone, out of the coastal zone. Another uh, common category of what is the coast is elevation. How, how high are we, right? With the idea being that, hey, if we were um, you know, continuing our, our conceptual definition of, of the part of the land that's impacting the ocean and the part of the ocean that's impacting the land, right? Could imagine if somehow we had a, a cliff that was one mile high right here and our house is on top of that cliff, not as influenced by the daily tides and stuff, right? Whereas if we had a house that was um, half a foot above 
the tide line, we're going to be much more likely to be influenced by that. So elevation-based definitions are, are most typically used when we have some coastal hazard, hurricane-induced flooding, um, uh, uh, what else do I have? Sea level rise planning, that kind of stuff. The third, which is probably the one that you've, uh, we most commonly will encounter here in California because of uh, the Coastal Commission and stuff, which we'll, we'll talk about later, um, is, is a political uh, boundary, essentially arbitrary boundary defined uh, area. So the political boundaries tend to be convenient. So the, that data I showed you first to start us off, we talked about uh, you know, counties along the coast. What the hell is a county? Pfft, it's just some random political you know, blob, right? But nevertheless, uh, it's convenient. We, we can very easily look on a map right now and just see very quickly without having any other special tools if, it's, if we're a county that touches the ocean, doesn't touch the ocean. Uh, and I should say that these were all created before we have GIS, right? Before we have these wonderful tools that can do much finer scale partitioning of populations and areas and towns and, and, and landscape elements and all that kind of stuff. So, so we really inherited this political boundary issue because map making was more challenging back in the day. So distance, elevation, political. The different ways we can define the coastal zone. And then um, uh, here are some common, uh, I say common, not everybody uses them, but, but in terms of doing research, you would encounter these if you started searching the term, you know, coastal zone definition or coastal zone management, something like that. Um, one uh, that's uh, increasingly popular because of things like sea level rise is this so-called low elevation coastal zone. So in this case, we're combining both the distance uh, approach and the elevation approach. And the uh, one, one definition of low elevation coastal zones is an area that touches the coast or is right next to the coast but is also less than 10, 10 meters in elevation, so less than 30 feet uh, above mean high or high water. Great example of how, uh, of these definitions being created for a specific purpose, right? So very, this is a very useful thing if we're worried about hurricane flooding, let's say, or hurricane-induced flooding. But note, there's nothing in there about Subtitle. It doesn't say the area 10 millimeters in ele or 10 meters, excuse me, in elevation and 10 meters in depth. Right? They don't care about that because this is an operational definition created by folks that are trying to manage people or people or human structures, infrastructure, and 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 those folks, generally speaking, aren't caring about the underwater infrastructure. Okay. Uh, then another uh, pretty common one is just to just to call it a, a linear distance inland. Um, or for that matter, it could go out to sea, but again, usually it's, it's the inland is what people focus on. Um, and that would be a nice even number. Why 100? Because 100 is an even number. And why? Because 10 seems small and 1,000 seem too big. So that's literally why. So, so uh, fairly common to see something like 100 kilometer uh, uh, distance. And while this sounds like it's not that big a deal, so for us here in California, that might, might not be that big a deal. But once we start uh, going to global scale mapping and global scale uh, pattern hunting and things of that nature, that actually becomes non-trivial and is super, super dependent on our projection. And those of you that have taken GIS already or are in GIS will appreciate that. But suffice it to say, most people have not taken a class on geospatial science and, uh, and that's caused some issues. Uh, and it can easily cause some issues, particularly in our northern and southern uh, extremes of the uh, coastal zones around the world. Um, more and more, because of the issues that we that people recognize by picking, you know, as with any definition or model, there's there are good things, there's bad things about it. Increasingly, people are when you when you read academic papers more and more, they don't say things like 100 kilometers. They'll give you a range. They'll do their analysis based on 10, 50, 100, 150. And that, that um, is really, really useful to, um, for, for us coming into the 
So, you know, if, if these guys have been spending two years working on this, they probably understand the patterns. But you and I coming to this data set, particularly someone who's perhaps a manager, a policymaker, someone that's trying to look for some guidance, having a, a broader range is, is really helpful for that. But having said that, another common one is a 10 kilometer buffer, which sometimes people call the immediate coastal zone. Um, another, another way some people have defined the coastal zone is because I mentioned before how, how concentrated people are up against the coast and in coastal cities and stuff. Um, sometimes people have used population density as a measure of, of where the coastal zone ends. So when the population density drops off quickly, that's the end of the coastal zone, the coastal plain. Um, and then related to that is the, the uh, same kind of idea. The, it's, this is used as a proxy for population density, but the, the percentage of people living in urban areas. These last two uh, approaches um, are historically were chosen because it was a little bit harder to get the raw data. As we get the raw data, you, don't you, you could do this yourself, but, but that's why these historically have been popular. And, um, and this percent of coastal populations living in urban areas, that actually still has some, uh, is still uh, surprisingly popular in some circles, I would say, um, because it's sort of a shorthand for the number of people that are in a structure that needs to be defended or, 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 or protected or armored or, or in some way uh, intensively managed to, to deal with things like sea level rise. Okay, so, some, so, the, so those are some common global measures, low, low elevation coastal zone, a uh, uh, 100 kilometer buffer, something shorter like a 10 kilometer buffer, uh, number of, uh, excuse me, density of people, and then the fraction of folks that are in um, an urban area. Uh, in the US, uh, the most uh, common, as, as you're reading these papers and looking at, as we look at government reports and things of that nature, the county-based approach is really, really common. Again, I showed that, I, I referenced that already. And so how that breaks down is coastal watershed counties, meaning a county and a watershed that drains directly to the ocean. The Mississippi River, right, drains, you know, almost half of the, 40 odd percent of the continental US, right? So in theory, any drop of water is eventually gonna make it to the ocean. Not so much talking about that. We're more talking about um, uh, the uh, uh, Conejo Creek here that drains into um, Cayugas Creek that then in turn drains right into the ocean, right? So we're talking about more um, uh, immediate draining into the ocean. But basically, coastal watershed counties or non, or coastal shoreline counties. So coastal watersheds would include something um, that is a bit farther inland. If it's in that watershed, the shoreline counties are the counties that exactly touch the ocean or an, or an embayment. So the counties around San Francisco Bay, uh, Los Angeles, those would be shoreline counties. Uh, and then again, the contrast would be non-shoreline counties. Um, you so, and then we sometimes hear inland versus ocean. That would be obviously touching the ocean or not. A, a fairly politically common approach is the inclusion of the Great Lakes in the coastal zone. Has anybody been to any of the Great Lakes? One, two, two. So can you guys see across? Well, which one do you guys go to? Michigan? Minnesota. Can you guys see across the lake? Yeah, no, it looks like the ocean, right? I mean, it, it, it's huge, right? Gigante, a crazy, loco, gigante, right? So, um, so uh, there are some natural reasons why um, they share some, of the, they, they have coast guards, for example, right? That's some of the, you know, if you're on a small boat and a storm comes up, you need to take safety procedures as if you are out on the um, open ocean, right? So there's some natural reasons for this, but turns out, Another main reason why we use this uh, ocean plus Great Lake Shores uh, as, a, as a category is to get the voting uh, members from folks in states and, and districts around the Great Lakes. So if we include them, we're like, hey, we want money for the coast. They're like, okay. So that was sort of a political uh, debate that happened long ago, and that's how we've inherited that. All right, uh, and then we have a whole series of arbitrary definitions for what we mean by the coast. 
so uh, the, the, the best, um, so we have all kinds of examples of sea level rise planning. Because we don't have um, super robust, super supported, uh, as we should, nation, nationwide, you know, federal level uh, sea level rise planning, it happens in fits and starts here and there where certain, uh, certain folks in the current administration, for example, don't know it exists, so it goes on. Right? And, they've, and the current administration has worked very, very hard to quash any, any level of funding for this type of stuff. So sea level rise planning tends to be more decentralized. So you and I might do a study. Maybe you're going to do a study for your capstone on sea level rise. And, and for your particular project in your local area with your local need or your particular needs, you're going to make a definite, I'm defining the coast as da 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 da, right? So a bit arbitrary. Probably the best and the one that we'll see the most example of an arbitrary definition of the coastal zone is uh, the coastal zone as, as defined by the California Coast Commission and, and the act that gave birth to the Co California Coast Commission. Doesn't really make any sense, but it's, it's what it is. Because uh, we, we have to have a line, we have to have a line somewhere. If we're going to talk about stuff in this zone and that zone, we need everybody has to agree on where the line is. And so there was the definition of a line. Um, so here's here's a here's a few facts. This is from uh, the last big census. Um, so a small fraction, only eight percent of the number of all the counties actually touch salt water. Um, or if we're if we're talking about the, the aerial extent of the counties, 16% of the land mass is in a county that touches the um, water. But um, we have almost one third of the population in those counties, a half of the most um, populous cities, and 70% um, of uh, the the largest counties are in are in this zone. Right. So again. It's not everybody, it's not everything, but it's, we're way batting outside of our weight, weight class, right? The, the number of people, the economic activity, all these metrics don't correlate with just the gross uh, aerial extent or numerical extent or what have, what have you. Okay, so here's another one of those, uh, arb here's one of those arbitrary uh, definitions, the, the mother of the arbitrary definition. That's our California coastal zone. So the, the, as we'll hear about later, um, the California Coast Commission first began by people being ticked off. And they said, this is ridiculous, I don't like this, uh, let's do something different. And so they used the ballot, that they used our um, ability to put on propositions onto our state ballot, which was created originally earlier that century to deal with robber barons because people were freaked out that these very powerful political folks were getting into office and doing crazy stuff. And they didn't, they didn't, weren't in touch with the rest of the people and they were making decisions that were bad and ill-informed and they were full of themselves and they were tweeting, no, just kidding. And so they were doing all this weird stuff. And so we created this ability for you guys, so-called direct democracy, for you guys to vote on particular uh, uh, issues. And so when people were very frustrated in the late 60s, early 70s, they said, hey, let's, let's use that tool. And so we'll create this new, originally it was called Proposition 20, we'll create this new uh, structure for managing the coastal zone. It passed, it succeeded. And then um, against the interests of many of the sort of, much of the political establishment, and then, um, the legislature saw the writing on the wall. The legislators saw the writing on the wall. So then they actually codified it, and then it, it, they said, "Okay, we'll, we'll pass this act that'll modify the California State Constitution, etc." So, so that the Coastal Commission that you and I know now operates under the auspices of the of the the chartering um, language from 1976, but it started in 72. Yeah. Is that what also defines all the terms that you're talking yes. about? Yes. Yes. Yes, and so in this 1976, we have a map, and I'll show you in a second, we have a map of the coastal zone, for example. So this is what we, what we if, this, if it's to the right, it's in, if it's to the left, it's out, or whatever the, the case may be. Okay, so that's the California Coast Commission. Um, and and so sort of these, these same forces that were saying, hey, we should do something differently with our coastal resources, we're also operating elsewhere in the US, and this led, Again, more on this later, but, but this led to um, 
uh, uh, wider uh, dealing with coastal zone stuff, which we know is the Coastal Zone Management Act or, or Coastal Zone Management, broadly writ. Um, that's a federal level thing. And um, I was say, okay, so, so uh, we have a, a larger approach to dealing with the coastal zone. The Coastal Commission deals with the bulk of almost everything we're going to talk about. So development in the coast, meaning putting a new uh, bathroom outside your house, putting in a new um, freeway, stuff like that. Um, they operate all around the coast except for the San Francisco Bay Area because different, right? So the San Francisco Bay Area is managed by an a, a already existing entity that was, that was in existence uh, before the, the proposition, before the act passed. And so uh, San Francisco Bay is out, and we'll see this time and time again, the San Francisco Bay, which is technically coast, it meets the definition of all our, these examples here, are you touching salt water, are you close to it? But as we'll see time and time again, they go their own way. So eventually when we start talking, for example, about marine protected areas, all of the state, all the entirety of the water, ocean, uh, salt water of the state is um, in one or more planning areas for, well, I shouldn't say, is in one of our planning areas for um, establishing protected areas. When we did the overhaul, all that's great, except the San Francisco Bay Area. So they have an exemption and they've never done it yet. Everybody else has been done for uh, you know, over five years. Um, actually getting closer to 10 years. So, um, so okay, so we have California Coast Commission, San Francisco Bay Conservation Development Commission. Um, and then we have another entity that does do a lot of stuff in the coastal zone. And so they also will use the definition, this, this arbitrary definition of what is the coast and what isn't. Um, but they're different. And, and I just flagged these guys here for you because they're very easy to get confused. And much of the public, so uh, a fair number, of, well, as we'll see from our surveys, um, but a, a good number of people know, have heard of the California Coast Commission. They might not know what it does, but they've heard about it. Not that many people have heard of the California Coastal Conservancy. So again, it's another state entity. It's another part of the state. These guys basically just take care of acquiring land and doing the, so the California Coastal Commission doesn't own any land, for example. Well, they might lease their, their office building or something, but they don't, they don't uh, they're just regulating what the activities that people do on it. The Coastal Conservancy can actually buy land and turn this area into a park, make it into a trail, um, uh, whatever, that kind of thing. All of this, though, is revolving around this definition of the coastal zone. And this is what that coastal zone looks like. So it's uh, different thicknesses in different areas. Oh, well, there you go. I'll just stare at that for a second. It's just so interesting. Um, and so even before we zoom in, just looking at this really far, far area, if you look, some areas, the pink is thicker. Yeah? Some areas, the pink is thinner. So that's of, that's of interest. And so this is our coastal zone, the definition of the coastal zone for you and I in the state of California since 1976. It, again, let me reemphasize, it was created by politicians, not scientists, not geographers, not, not mapping experts, right? It was created by elected representatives. It was also created before we had what we now would consider GIS. So again, the era when mapping was much more challenging. It was in big rooms with uh, people with big you know, paper maps and drawing stuff on the maps and that kind of stuff. Because of that, the coastal zone in the, in the, the definition, so, so oh, I just gave you all those great definitions. Oh, 10 meters inland, 100 kilometers inland, a certain elevation, that means nothing. That means nothing. Those were, those were most of the world and dealing with large scale patterns, right? For legal issues in the state of California, that stuff means nothing. So our coastal zone varies. So it goes from, from a tenth of a mile from, I'm talking the landward extent, it goes a tenth of a mile inland to five miles. Again, miles and not kilometers because they're lame, right? Uh, and then seaward, it goes, it goes out to sea three miles anywhere we are, any part of the coast. So the, the going off to sea is, is consistent, the going out to sea is consistent. The landward edge, though, is highly, highly variable. Um, so if we're in, and this is, now this, this is not hold true all the time, because when it was being, again, this is the act created by 
the legislature. So as with all things in the legislature, there's some wheeling and dealing that's going on, right? And so as it's getting passed, he's like, hey, what if we move this line over to here in my territory? If you do, then I'll vote for you, like that kind of thing, right? Um, but, but the starter, uh, the default condition was it went inland to the first major ridge line. With you know, sort of the initial thinking, okay, if a drop of water hits that, it's going to immediately run the ocean, right? If it's on if it's if it's on that side of the hill, it's next to the the ocean. Uh, or if if it's just really super flat, or if it's just a really I suppose really broad slope, um, no more than five miles inland from mean high or high water. Whichever one is closer is the one they're going to is the one that they initially started to use, but then. When you go to individual sites, sometimes it was, it was shoved one way or the other, but that, that's the approach that was taken. In urban areas, Los Angeles, San Diego, um, it is very, very close. And, it, and it, it sometimes just a block or so inland, or two blocks inland, something like that. Uh, again, like everything else, San Francisco Bay is different. So it doesn't, there is no San Francisco uh, well, the parts of San Francisco that are the ocean, the sites that are facing the open ocean, there's a coastal zone there. But the parts of the San Francisco Bay that are facing uh, the bay itself, that's not defined by um, that's not defined by the Coastal Act again, because because the, specifically the San Francisco Bay was excluded, the interior part of the bay was excluded from um, the negotiations and stuff. Okay, so again, this is what it looks like for us. So what we get is we get in, in Oxnard, kind of, but really, really in particular, places like Venice Beach, Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, Marina del Rey, right? Very, very thin. It's a razor thin chunk of the, the potential area it could be. Whereas when we get to the Santa Monica Mountains, oh my God, it's going inland for quite a ways, right? And so, so that causes no, that's caused no end of people. Some people claim that is invalid because of that very because of that inequality that that lack of consistency amongst who is in who is out who is regulated who isn't uh, and then in certain places like these areas where there aren't that many people like Catalina Island Santa Rosa Island etc it's like the whole thing right there there was no constituents there saying no don't put that in the coastal zone um, and then this is just a, a more of a political map with the blue line here designating where it is and where it isn't. Um, cool. Questions so far? Yeah, sorry. So in the Santa Monica Mountains, does that happen because the watershed ridge line? Is that what yes. Is? Yeah, so, so, so the, the, the top of that um, in some places is the ridge line. In other places, it's the five miles. So, so, so Santa Monica, since they weren't back in the early 70s there weren't as many millionaires living up there as there are now it was they didn't have much of a constituency so like yeah sure yeah we'll call that and then we'll protect pacific palisades we'll protect santa monica you know, the, you know from from inclusion in this management regime because again recall that um i'm not trying to be disparaging or saying bad things about the legislature i didn't mean that but but they uh this was creating a new bureaucracy and they weren't sure how this was going to play out and so they, their constituents, they want, hey, I don't know if this is going to be good or bad for my people, so maybe I want to keep them out. Was, you know, it wasn't necessarily one political side or the other or one people from northern or south. It was just in general creating another bureaucracy and people had trepidation as to what this would mean for their constituents. And so there was in many, not everywhere, but in many places, people were like, let's, let's minimize this as much as we could. And so when they had an opportunity to have this, you know, an area of L.A. County, let's say, Okay, we're going to shrink this one area of LA County, but then we're going to let this other one be big. So they, they look more magnanimous, right? Kind of thing. Okay. All right, cool. And, and, for, and then there's also just, you know, other logical reasons uh, that you might, might want to have. I mean, well, let me be careful. Um, there's, it's very understandable why you might want to have different thicknesses. So in the city of LA, you have a huge bureaucracy managing things like fire alarms and when you want to add a second home or excuse me, second, uh, second room and things like that, right? They have existing bureaucracies. Much of the Santa Monica Mountains, if we're taking the Los Angeles County example, but also the same for Ventura, uh, it's unincorporated county. So the political tools to regulate what people do or don't do are, are, are generally speaking much less rigorous than in these big urban cores. 
And so, uh, so you can make the argument that, okay, so uh, they don't have as many safeguards, let's say, for protecting wildlife. They don't have as many um, safeguards for looking after uh, coastal dependent industries. So by, by having a more expansive definition of the coastal zone in those areas, we might be able to aid uh, folks that are doing coastal dependent things or, or protecting wildlife or something. Yeah? Okay. Okay, and then just uh, in to show you some another example, so that was California. If we talk about what's the coastal zone in Louisiana, um, some of you guys have been with us to Louisiana, maybe some of you guys will go with us uh, this spring, but they, their um, coastal zone is managed by the Louisiana, that's, that's Louisiana, not Los Angeles, just to be clear. So Louisiana Coastal uh, Management Program, which has been in effect since the early, uh, since 1980. Um, and theirs is managed by the Department of Natural Resources, which is under the Office of Coastal Management. And so for them, um, the coastal zone is anywhere from 16 to 32 miles inland. So for clarity, for those of us that haven't been to Louisiana, it's pancake, is a very flat, right? So there's, there's, there's no, what we would call coastal mountains. There's, there's not like that topographic complexity. So um, it's, it's, it's a pancake and, and go really far inland. Um, and so uh, that coastal zone encompasses about 40% of all of the coastal wetlands in all of the lower 48 states. So it, it's, it's, it's all a wetland, swamp, moist ground, no rocks, flat, that kind of thing. So a very different conceptualization of what is the coastal zone in a place like that as compared to California. Um, in, North, in North Carolina, um, theirs is regulated by the coastal management program uh, that's been in existence sort of in between the two, right? Between the early 70s and between 1980 um, and regulated by a different division. Um, they're at, so interesting, uh, North Carolina shared, well, so North Carolina has its issues, as do we all. So one of the things is uh, they do things like define uh, that sea level rise doesn't exist, so therefore it doesn't exist, you know, things like this. So, so they have some issues. But um, North Carolina is definitely, uh, if we say, look at the southern area of the U.S., they're by far probably, I would argue, the most advanced in terms of figuring out more modern ways to manage their coastal zone. Uh, and so they... So theirs uh, was actually passed before our, well, so our ballot measure came beforehand, but as far as a state, you know, into the state code of regulations, theirs came actually before our current one. Ours was 76, recall. These guys define the coastal zone as 20 coastal counties that in whole or in part uh, touch either the open shoreline or an embayment, um, a so-called sound. And interestingly, one of the things that these guys do is they have two tiers. It's not just coastal zone or not coastal zone. They have these so-called areas of environmental concern, and that would be what we might call the most immediate, most obvious coastal things, like a, like a sand dune or like a coastal salt marsh or something like that. And then they have the, the, the areas in that, in that coastal zone that might be impacting those things. So they're not so much concerned with regulating the stuff outside the dune area, they're more interested in regulating the stuff outside the dune area because it might hurt the dunes, right? Which is a different approach in California. California is like, boom, here's the area. Everything in this boundary, we're going to apply our policies and, and actions equally. Yeah? Okay. Um, so here are the coastal counties in the U.S. So I've excluded the Great Lakes uh, from this, but th this is, these are the coastal counties. Look familiar to us. And, and again, uh, West Coast, East Coast, Gulf Coast. Okay, so maybe uh, I've been talking for a while. So uh, before we break, uh, let me guys ask you this question. So which counties grew of, these, of the coastline of the US, which counties grew the most over the last 50 years? So pull up a piece of paper and pick, I don't know, two or three counties that you think, uh, for the whole US, whole US, which counties do you think grew the most? And then I think I have, yeah. Okay, so here's, so I want, I, I see two different categories of your answer. One is uh, just absolute number of people, bodies. And number two is relative change. 
All right, we've got about a minute or two before we get back. So people that are here, why don't you tell me what you guys, uh, or some of your uh, votes for the the uh, most change in gross numbers of people at County. San Diego. San Diego? LA. LA. San yeah. Diego. LA. LA. San Francisco. Orange County. Miami. Miami. Somebody said something after Orange County. Miami. No, no, somebody said something after Orange County. Oh, Miami. Miami? That's Dade, right? Yeah. Dade. Dade. <coughs> Other guesses? So there we go. Here is, here's what the data looks like in a map context. Probably can't make sense of that. Here's what the, here's what the, can you see this? Here's the answer. The so first is number, and then uh, and the bottom, and the lower half is the percentage. So it might be a little hard to see. Oops, sugar cane. Okay. So, uh, on the middle column here is the population in 1960. On this uh, column just to the right is the population in uh, 2008. And this is the change. So whoever guessed LA County as being the most numerically increased county, you're correct. Who guessed that? Ah, oh, nice, nice, nice. And then uh, for uh, a proportional change, Florida. Because Florida had nobody, uh, so Collier County had 50, uh, just under 16,000 people, and uh, you know, up to 315,000 uh, folks. So if we look at there, so where are we? So LA, so in the terms of the gross numbers, right? Here's LA County, here's Orange County, here's San Diego County, a couple more down, Santa Clara, up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Contra Costa, San Francisco Bay Area, Ventura, there you guys are, what? Mm. I thought you guys got like snacks, so you're all energetic or something. Uh, Alameda, also Bay Area, Oakland area, uh, and the rest are not us. And then if we look at proportional changes, they're almost all, or they all are, outside of the U.S., right? I mean, out <laughs> Wow, outside of California, I meant to say. Uh, so um, yeah, so a lot of it's floor, a lot of these places that didn't have much stuff. Post World War II, in the case of Florida, more air conditioning, more livable conditions, all that kind of stuff allowed it to uh, explode. And then in recent years, with old fo older folks that are retired, that are looking for a, a less uh, less inclement weather, kind of thing. Cool. Um, now, another thing that we're seeing is uh, not only are we seeing the shift in terms of more people in the coastal zone, I mean, we already had more people, but there's even more and more people, uh, depending on how we want to slice it, number-wise or proportion-wise. And uh, we're also increasing in terms of our urbanization, in terms of our hardening of stuff. So let's have a look at this. So here's the US. Um, Inside this first line, okay, so again, so here we go. Here's 1960, here's 2008, 
And so this is the gross numbers, and this is the proportional change. Um, and so uh, let, let's look at percent here. So for metro versus not metro, so urban versus rural, you could call it. So back in the day, we were uh, two thirds uh, urban. Now we're more like 80 odd percent, right? If we talk about uh, counties that touch the coast, we've gone from those urban areas from uh, 86 to 90, almost everybody at the coast lives in a city is what this is saying, right? Compared to, well, outside the coastline, of course, our cities are growing as well proportionally. More people are in cities everywhere, which is part of the story of the death of rural America. But, but um, it hasn't changed that that much. I mean, it's gone up, but it's not as much as almost you're getting close to 100% in coastal. So again, these different patterns uh, in, in the coastal zone, immediate coastal zone versus inland. Um, let's look at what this looks like uh, glo uh, globally. And so this is uh, some data from this d data set called Place, and it is uh, derived based upon um, nighttime uh, illumination. So as as a proxy for uh, people, and, and they've they've trans a lot of work um, adding additional demography and stuff, but they've translated this into uh, what it looks like across the globe because we don't have equal reporting in the middle of Africa and the north of Russia and stuff. So this is a way to do it independent of any one particular country's definition or individual uh, censusing efforts. And so this is what we see. So this is uh, the number of people with the color ramp going up to the right means more people per square kilometer. The, the lighter, the paler the color, uh, the, the less folks. So here's, so in this case, this is a 200 kilometer band. Again, with our modern GIS and, and geospatial tools, it's very easy. Once you have this data disaggregated or this data in a raster type format, for those of you guys that have taken GIS, it's easy. We can just say, oh, what if it was 99 kilometers or 102 kilometers or whatever, right? And so in this case, they picked 200 kilometers, which translates to 124 miles. That's the pink zone. And if I just go and I delete everything else for you, that's what we see. So I think it's easier to see without all that other jazz. So I've deleted the ocean and I've deleted the, the areas farther than 200 kilometers from a shoreline. Yeah, there you go, right? So Asia is a lot more orange and brownish, right? And in particular, Southeast Asia, right? Uh, uh, you know, compare that to our, you know, we, we think you know, we tend to think there's so many people here, and there are, but we're basically whitish, grayish on this color ramp, right, compared to some of these areas that are, that are medium orange to burnt umber kind of color. How do you fit 50,000 people in a colony? You move to Bangladesh. <laughs> So one, one of the most densely populated areas on the West Coast, it used to be the most, I don't know if it still is. When I went to school, UCSB, most students live in Isla Vista, IV right next to it. For a while, that was the most densely populated area in, in our part of the world. Why? Because a bunch of college kids have any money and a bunch of slumlords are just packing people in and packing people in. So, so you get lots of people when um, folks don't have, generally speaking, don't have a lot of affluence and they don't have a lot of option to move far away. So by definition, either because of work or school or, or whatever constraint, they're tied to a place and they essentially just live on top of each other, basically. And that's how you get it. And then in these areas in, in Southeast Asia, Singapore, a place like that, they, they build high rises and they can, they can get a lot of people on a two dimension, with, with, with for us, I mean, obviously there's some limit to how many physical bodies we can squeeze into an X and Y area, but if you're going up or sometimes into the ground, right, you can get more people stacking that way. Cool. Questions? Okay. Um, uh, you, you guys have some readings on this, but, but suffice it to say, um, our population is increasing at the coast as we've said, and it's also increasing at a greater rate than the um, other 
areas. So the slopes are all going up everywhere around the planet. There's more and more people. But the slopes in the coastal zone are steeper than the slopes uh, in areas outside of the coastal zone. So this is the total population in California. This first, so we're going to move up in different elevational increments. So I, I just showed you that stuff was dis, right? that was a distance measure of coastal zone as we talked about. Here's one that's an elevational uh, measure. Yeah. Okay, so these are we're looking at these California counties, and we're talking about how many people live at or below the given elevation. This first slide is one foot above mean high or high water. Okay, and again, is this okay? Should I turn the lights off? Is this? You guys see this okay? Okay, so again, the color ramp here indicates a higher number. So the, the bluer the color, the more people um, uh, in this particular area that are at this particular elevation. And then if you're really curious, on the right, it lists the county and the number of folks. And if you guys are interested, you can check this out yourself. You can just search for this or you can type in riskfinder.org and play around and within a couple links you can uh, check this out. Um, as an aside, these are the kind of tools that we need. So these are the kind of tools to address a lot of these coastal and marine management issues, interactive tools, free tools, tools that are intuitive, that are well designed, that are not made for nerdy dorks like you and me, but are made for Joe Blow public, for him or her to play with this thing and, and engage with the information and they can do what if questions on their own, right? We need more of that to have a more informed public to have a better discussion that involves everybody from all walks of society uh, in these important decisions. Okay, so here we go. So here's one foot, here's two feet, three feet. Now, so far the pattern hasn't changed. I mean, the numbers are going up, but, but you know, the gross pattern hasn't changed that much. Uh, four feet, five feet. We're starting to get into some of these uh, areas now that are uh, inland. Seven feet. Nine feet, 10 feet, boom. So, uh, so what this tells us is that, yes, coastal zone matters, but there are, there's variation in this coastal zone, right? Because this is an elevational measure. Some places, like say the Santa Monica's, or people that are on a ridge top in the Santa Monica's are a lot less vulnerable to um, the particular sea level rise issue than someone in, you know, Monterey, in, in Salinas or something like that in Monterey. Uh, I think we'll go through this next part fairly quick because time is getting on. Um, but I'll just say that there's different approaches, different entities have used. A lot of times for global scale, so I've talked so far about U.S. stuff. When we talk about global scale stuff, um, again, because of the issue of data interoperability, is that can the data talk to each other? Was the data collected consistently? That gets to be challenging. So one of the places that people, uh, or one, one of the locations you can go to to find data is uh, the United Nations and some of the affiliated entities with the United Nations. Um, these guys typically use shoreline distance and elevation data. Uh, most of the UN stuff is worried about population pressure on resources and vulnerability to um, uh, climate induced uh, uh, problems, a storm surge or something of that nature. Um, a very widely cited uh, study, which was the, started in 1999, um, we know as the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. They defined it as, again, using both a distance and an elevational measure. So they used uh, less than a, a 100 kilometers or less from the ocean and uh, 50 meters or less in uh, height. And it was an either or. Any one of those could, if you were within one of those two, it would trigger uh, you being in their definition of a coastal zone. Um, and some other examples. Okay, um, so again, to, to reiterate stuff we just talked about, uh, the, our largest cities are on the coast. The density of people, of human beings on the planet is greatest in the co at the coastal zone. Um, we, these, while we, I haven't presented you the economic data yet, suffice it to say these coastal zones are very energetic. Lots of activity, be that uh, social activity, creative activity, um, economic activity, whatever, that, that, that's really, we're really the uh, movers and shakers uh, in, by and large, definitely compared to how our, our overall acreage compared to the rest of the country. Density of creation, density of economic activity is, is crazy. 
And then again, we have distinct patterns. The coastal zone has distinct patterns relative to inland areas. Cool? Questions? Okay. Oh, oh yeah, and this, this other, other key idea was that uh, more people, key factoid, more people are alive at the coast, uh, to, in the coastal zone today than were alive in 1950. There's about a billion-ish people, mostly concentrated in Asia, in particular Southeast Asia, and that our last official census, we have predictions for each year, but the last official enumeration, um, 123 million people in the coastal zone, and we are likely to see something on the order of 134 million people uh, in the coastal zone of the U.S. in uh, the next, in the 2020 census.